think we've got our final people taking a seat. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rowan Conway. I'm Director of Innovation here at the RSA, and I'd like to welcome you here tonight for tonight's very special event. Before we begin, can I ask you to turn your mobile phones to silent? Um, we are filming and live streaming over the web, so welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Um, and a reminder that the hashtag tonight is Everybody Lies, so please join the discussion on Twitter, and Seth can data mine it later. Um, I'm now absolutely delighted to welcome our guest speaker this evening. Um, Seth Stevens Davadowitz. That was right, wasn't it? Close enough. Close enough. I always get it wrong. Seth is um, a New York Times op ed contributor, a visiting lecturer at the Wharton School, and a former Google data scientist. His research uses big data sources to uncover the hidden behaviors and attitudes that we all share. He's appeared in various prestigious publications, including the Journal of Public Economics. His new book, Everybody Lies, has caused waves across the globe with its surprising insights, and he's going to share them liberally with us this evening, that um, go into our innermost thought processes, things that we didn't think anyone could see, um, and marks a whole new sphere of social sciences. I'm personally fascinated to hear about what we can learn from the digital truth serum and what's behind the Google closet. So I'm going to hand straight over to you, Seth. Welcome. All right, well, uh, thank you so much, Rowan, for that kind introduction, and thanks everyone for coming and for welcoming me to your lovely uh, country. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this, this, this research, which has been about five years of work uh, that culminated uh, with this book that's coming out Thursday in the UK. And the key to this book, uh, for the past 80 years, if you want to know people's thoughts, if you want to know what they want, what they're going to do, why they do the things they do, you have one main approach. You ask them. You conduct a survey, you do a focus group, uh, and use that data to tell us who people are. And there's a main problem with this approach, which is that people have been shown over and over again to lie to surveys. Uh, they don't tell the truth. They shade things in the direction of things that sound good. Either they're lying deliberately to another person, or they may be lying to themselves they want uh, to feel better about themselves and aren't being honest with themselves. So uh, my favorite example of this, uh, this is the United States, but I imagine would be similar uh, in Britain. If you ask American women uh, how frequently they have sex, this is a general social survey, the biggest survey in the United States, how frequently do they have sex and how frequently do they use a condom? American women over the age of 18 say, say on average they have sex once a week and use a condom 20% of the time. You do the math, this means they're using 1.1 billion condoms every year in heterosexual sexual encounters. This is only heterosexual women. Uh, heterosexual men, you do the same uh, thing. They say they have sex 1.5 times a week, you use a condom 20% of the time. This adds up to 1.6 billion uh, condoms every year in heterosexual sex, uh, which you already know this is heterosexual sex. By definition, these have to be the same. Uh, we know that someone's not telling the truth, right? Uh, so who's telling the truth, men or women? Uh, I collected data from Nielsen on how many condoms are sold every year in the United States, and only 600 million condoms, <laughs> condoms are sold, so everybody now is lying about sex and exaggerating. Uh, the only difference is by how much, uh, men, men even more than women. Uh, so I think we're not in the dark as much as we used to be, which is we now have this remarkable source, thanks to the internet, uh, people tend to be really, really honest in the searches they make. Uh, when they're why are they so honest on Google? We know the conditions that tend to make people more honest. They tend to be more honest when they're alone. Uh, they tend to be more honest when they're on the internet. And I think more important, the reason that people are so honest in their Google searches is that it gives you an incentive to tell the truth. So you never have an incentive to tell the truth to Google, uh, to, to a survey, uh, so people just feel the need, oh, I'll, I'll shade it a little bit. But if you need information, you got to tell that to Google. So you see a different picture of people on Google than you would in, in any other source. So actually, this is in the United States. Uh, there are more searches for porn than weather in the United States, uh, even though only about 20% of men and 4% of women say they watch porn in surveys. So a very, very different uh, view of people on Google than you'd see in surveys. And I checked in, in Britain, and there are actually more searches for weather, probably because you have worse weather. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's not a blowout. It's close. But, uh, <laughs> But, but you see that. So I think the, the idea with this is you have an incentive. Uh, you don't have to tell a survey that you watch porn, but if you want to watch porn, maybe you're going to put that into, into Google. 
Uh, and I think, I, I, going back to the lack of sex thing, uh, we see a, a very different view of sex uh, in the world, in every country, on Google than we do elsewhere. The number one complaint about a marriage by far is that it's sexless, far more common complaint than it's unhappy or loveless. The number one complaint everybody has about a partner, whether it's a husband, wife, boyfriend, or girlfriend, is that the partner won't have sex with me. Uh, that easily beats the second complaint that the partner won't text me back. <laughs> and they're actually, you start to see things that, that, that go against some conventional wisdom. There are actually twice as many complaints that a boyfriend won't have sex with me than a girlfriend won't have sex with me, uh, which goes against the traditional idea that men want, young men want sex all the time and, woman, and young women are, are more withholding. So uh, definitely a, a different view of people. That's kind of the incentive that Google gives you. The other thing, probably the most surprising thing in my research, and I still do not totally understand this, <laughs> and maybe someone in this audience will give me, give, 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 give me a better idea of this, is that people don't just ask questions to Google, they type statements to Google, <laughs> like in large numbers. Seemingly everybody does this. They might say that I hate my boss or I'm drunk. My favorite is I love my girlfriend's boobs. Like why are you telling Google this? What's Google gonna, gonna help you? I think maybe my, a working hypothesis is we're so used to telling Google things that we don't tell anyone else that we just kind of use it as it's a confessional or a therapist. We just put our thoughts down uh, onto Google. But it is, uh, it is very striking. All right, so Google is digital truth serum. And what can we learn kind of more social science-y questions uh, from, from this data? And uh, the way I started my research, I started my research in this area was back in 2012. Uh, I, st I started discovering Google Trends data, and I was interested in this question of racism in the United States. And if you remember way back when, uh, 2008, uh, when Barack Obama was elected president of the United States, there was this idea that if we could elect a black man in, the, in America, and we could elect him in so by a, a pretty substantial margin, then race couldn't be a huge issue in the United States. People were saying we lived in a post-racial society. That was the idea back then. And this wasn't just that Obama was elected, it was also if you asked people right after the election, did you care that Obama was black when you voted, if you asked that to Americans? Uh, 98, 99% said, no, 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 of course not. And maybe the one or 2% didn't understand the question or just trying to get the person off the phone. Like, the Americans just in, in this day and age do not say that they, that they care about someone's skin color, that they're racist uh, to a survey. So I looked at, at Google searches back in, in, in 2012, and I said, Can you, what, what, what did this tell us about races? When people are alone, when people have an incentive to tell the truth, uh, what, are they, what, what would this tell us? And the first thing I noted was the shocking degree to which people are making racist searches on Google. So this is Google searches, I have to use sorted language if you can imagine what a racist search is. This is the percent of Google searches that include the, the very disturbing racist word nigger in the United States. And people are making this search with, in the time period I was looking at with the same frequency as Migraine or Economist or Lakers, the Los Angeles basketball team, uh, The Daily Show, the popular show in the United States. This wasn't a fringe search. This was like a really, really common search in the United States. Millions of people were making this search uh, every year. And uh, the, the other thing that was, was striking in this data was that the map looked different than I would have guessed. So when we think of the United States, uh, if you know anything about the history of the United States, we usually think of racism as a southern issue. That's what the Civil War in America was fought. But while there are many southern areas that are high in, in racism, there are also many places in the north, in the northeast, in the Midwest, Michigan, and Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And we usually think in the United States that racism is uh, predominantly concentrated among the conservative Republican Party, but it's about equally split these racist searches among more liberal Democratic areas and, and conservative Republican areas. So I was kind of blown away. Wow, people are making this search in huge numbers, and they're making it search in places I didn't think were racist, and that we didn't think there was so much racism. So I'll spare you the details. You can read my book if you want to know all the details of, of this and, and the academic work that, that's been written on it. But you basically see about as strong a relationship as you see in social sciences that places that are darker on this map, darker red, supported Obama far less than any Democratic candidate they had in the past. And you can try to explain it by anything else in the data. Nothing explains it. Just huge numbers of Americans were secretly not supporting Obama 
because he was black. It's very, very clear in the data. So I wrote this. It got a little attention, but not that much. People still thought we lived in a post-racial society. And then Donald Trump appeared, right? <laughs> Uh, so they asked uh, a data journalist at the New York Times when Donald Trump was saying all these racially charged things and seemed to be doing better and better the more things he said. Uh, he emailed me, he said, Seth, you know, I, I remember your racism paper. Do you have this data? Can I look at it? So I sent him over this data on, on racist searches on Google, and he had data on support for Donald Trump in the Republican primary, and he found that of all the the things he could, the, he tried every variable, whether it was education, whether it was age, whether it was economic variables, whether it was gun ownership, whether it was exposure to trade, anything he could put in the model, nothing came close to the racist Google searches. And even if you look at this map closely, some of the exceptions can be explained by the that person in that state had a candidate, their own candidate running. So it's like a really, really a strikingly a strong relationship in, in the data. So I think it's very, very clear in this data that despite what people were saying, uh, there was a huge racism problem in the United States and it explains a lot of uh, political behaviors. All right, well, some people, I've, I've done that. I've done work on self-induced abortions, on closeted gay men, a lot of really, really things that I maybe always suspected uh, but have been hard to prove in the data. And a lot of people tell me, okay, Seth, like, you've proven some things that have been hard to prove, but we all suspected, right? We suspected that a lot of Americans were racist. We suspected that maybe Trump supporters, no matter what they said, uh, had some, some bad racial attitudes. Can you use this data to just, does this data just confirm our suspicions, or can you find things uh, that we, would have another, we, we wouldn't have otherwise known? So that's why I always come back with this example, uh, which is in India, the number one search that starts my husband wants and unless you've heard a previous appearance or already read my book, you wouldn't have guessed this. Uh, the number one search that says my husband wants in India of all searches is my husband wants me to breastfeed him. <laughs> Which, yes, I guarantee nobody knew beforehand. Uh, <laughs> and just shows, I think, the power of this data. And this isn't like cherry picked. You could have, somebody asked me, like, was there a movie called My Husband Wants Me to Breastfeed Him in India? Or like, what's going on? And uh, there, there wasn't, but also there's a, uh, different variants of this phrase. However you look at the phrase, uh, it's, it's, it kind of comes the same thing. In India, somewhat in Bangladesh, and basically nowhere else, uh, there's this large-scale, widespread desire that nobody talks about, and it's totally underground. Uh, but I'm convinced, I think 100% based on this data, that it exists. So, like, so this data really is going to tell us things uh, about ourselves that we otherwise uh, wouldn't have known. Now, I think one thing that's really important uh, when we think of this data is if you, if you read my book, there are a lot of things that aren't so cheery, uh, documenting parts of ourselves that maybe we wouldn't wish we didn't know about, whether it's uh, racism or child abuse or the self-induced abortion or closet gay men, all these areas where it's like, ah, oh, did, did, we, did, did we really need to know that? And if all big data did was tell us things about ourselves that maybe are a little uncomfortable, I think that wouldn't be necessarily so valuable. It would be depressing, but it wouldn't be so, so valuable. I think the real power in big data is by knowing these things, we can start to maybe change society, to improve society. So let me give you one uh, quick example of this uh, that, that, I, that I like. Uh, so after, in uh, December 2016, there was a, uh, December 2015, there was an attack in the United States in San Bernardino, California. Uh, two Muslim Americans shot up a party and they, they killed a bunch of people. And immediately after this attack, there was a huge rise in nasty searches about Muslims. The top search about Muslims right after this attack, literally within minutes, was kill Muslims. And people were searching, I hate Muslims. And I actually checked in uh, recently in Britain, the exact same thing happens after all these attacks, an explosion of rage against Muslims as soon as the attack happens. So, uh, and, and these, these attacks, these searches, might, while they may seem a little weird, are not innocent. They predict hate crimes against Muslims. So when people are making a lot of these searches, you can bet that a lot of mosques are going to be attacked or Muslim Americans are going to be beat up. It's, it's not, it's not uh, good for Muslim, from Muslims when, when people are making these kind of angry searches. So a few days after uh, the attack, Barack Obama went to give a speech to the nation. He wanted to talk about the dangers that the United States faces with terrorism, uh, but also he wanted to calm down this rage against Muslims. 
he wanted to tell people to try to stop kind of this virulent anti-Muslim attitude that had overtaken the, the United States. And he gave the speech, and it was very, very well received by just about everybody. It was kind of classic Obama, just beautiful, moving. He talked about how it's the responsibility of our Americans to not appeal to fear, to, to appeal to freedom, how it's our responsibility not to judge people because they have a different faith uh, than ours, uh, how it's our responsibility to let in people of, of different countries, no matter their religious background. That's who we are as Americans. And it got great reviews by all the serious uh, sources, all the great newspapers, all the pundits said, great speech, great speech, Obama. So we had this data, these Google search data, broken down minute by minute. And we could see during this nationalized televised speech and afterwards, what happened? Did people stop making these searches uh, for nasty things about Muslims? Did, did, did it calm down these angry uh, people? And we looked at the data, and we found not only did these searches kill Muslims, I hate Muslims, uh, Muslims are evil, they didn't drop, they didn't stay the same, they went way up and stayed up after the speech. So it seemed like everything Obama did, even though everybody said this is a great speech, he thought he did, did all the right things, everyone thought he did all the right things, backfired uh, for the purposes of its main goal, which was calming an angry mob. So a couple weeks later, uh, we, we published this in the New York Times. Uh, so actually, let me, let, me, let me say one thing. So, so is there anything else that Obama uh, could have done uh, maybe better? Well, there was one line at the end of his speech uh, that, where, he said, where he said something a little bit different. Uh, and, and listen to me for, for a bit here. He said that we have to remember that Muslim Americans are our friends and our neighbors. They're our sports heroes. And they're the men and women who are willing to die for our country. And you see, literally like seconds after Obama makes this statement, the fir the, for the first time in many years, the top descriptor of Muslims on Google was not Muslim extremists or Muslim terrorists or Muslim refugees. It was Muslim athletes, followed by Muslim soldiers. And that kept, kept the top spot for a week afterwards. And you saw all these people throughout the internet saying, Shaquille O'Neal is Muslim? Like, Muhammad Ali is Muslim? Like, I, I didn't know that. And you kind of said, and it's kind of like, oh, like, you know, this person I've been rooting for since I was a little kid is Muslim. That's, that's interesting. So we published this finding in the New York Times. Uh, I, I was working with, with a guy at Princeton, Evan Soltas, and, and we published this in the New York Times. And we said, like, look, compare these two strategies. One of them, responsibility. It's our responsibility. We, we, this, you know, this is who we are. It's not giving anyone new information. It's lecturing them. And it's telling them things they've heard a thousand times since they were you know, in their school books everywhere. Compare that to the line about uh, Muslim sports heroes and men and women who died for our country. That's giving people new information. It's provoking their curiosity. It's perhaps changing how they think about a group that's ca causing them so much rage. So I don't think it's totally crazy when you publish something in the New York Times that people in high places see that, uh, including in the president's office. Uh, because a couple weeks later, Obama gave another speech, again about Islamophobia, which wasn't doing so great in the country. And he gave it in a Baltimore mosque. Again, it got a lot of attention. It was nationally televised. And you see in this speech, you read the transcript, he totally changed his strategy. <laughs> he stopped with all the lectures. There was no responsibility. There was no, you know, this is what we have to do, what we must do, what you should do. It was all curiosity. It was that Muslim Americans had built the skyscrapers of Chicago. It's that Thomas Jefferson had a copy of his Koran. It's that Muslim Americans were immigrant uh, farmers uh, that, that helped build this country. Just a very, very different uh, tack. And we checked the, the searches after that speech. And you do see that many of the bad searches, I hate Muslims and kill Muslims, dropped after this one. So I don't want to say that we've solved hatred in the world <laughs> uh, based on a, a study of, of two speeches, but I do think it shows the power of this data that you could turn something uh, as seemingly chaotic and strange as calming an angry mob where we've just been basing ourselves on our intuition and patting ourselves on our back for you know, giving a, a nicely received speech. You could turn something like calming an angry mob into a science. And I think uh, that kind of makes the point of how social sciences are changing with this remarkable data on the internet, and I think uh, I'll, I'll, st I'll stop with that.
So let's talk about this. This is fascinating stuff. Thank you for um, taking us through so many different options of what we could learn about um, the inner workings of people's minds. Um, I want to start with your last point that you brought there around the kind of um, the power in improving, the potential power of improving society through this knowledge or this, the application of the knowledge you get from the research that you do. And it was interesting what you were talking about, about how leaders can best use this, but then there's also how society can best use this. I mean, I was mindful when you were talking there about Obama um, and, and those responses specifically to his words. Recently, um, well, last year, you know, the big Google search after the Brexit result is, what is the EU? You know, um, the big Google search after Trump pulled out of the climate accord was, what is climate change? And, and these things actually, as, as a kind of public engagement tool around subjects that people don't necessarily go into, and it, it, it actually could broaden some of the, the discourse through the fact that there's an interplay between what's happening between what leaders are saying and what, um, what people are trying to find out about what the meanings of that are. So I guess, I guess there's a question there about how do you use this proactively? How do leaders of the future start to work with this kind of data science? What would be the best way? Yeah, I think, I, I think probably in general, everyone makes fun of the what is Brexit or what, it, or what is the EU or what is climate change. And you know, I agree those are not sophisticated questions, but I think it does tell us that in general, politicians probably exaggerate how informed the public is. And, you know, having a more basic, uh, you know, having more basic uh, explanations of things and, and kind of, you know, if, if you want to say dumbing it down, but like a lot of people are paying very little attention to this stuff. And I think we assume that people are paying a lot more attention and politicians assume. And if you, if you get people, the people who agree to be in a focus group are some of the most active people. So we don't necessarily get these people who are paying a lot less attention. Uh, so that would be one area. You know, again, this, this can kind of be used good and bad. I think one of the things, unfortunately, we learn about uh, people's uh, political preferences from this data is that they care a lot less about policy than they say they do. Uh, so if you, if you ask people in, in a survey, you know, what do you want to hear from the candidates? More policy talk. What are, what's their plan? What's their plan? What's their plan? I mean, people have their plans on the website. No, but very few people are Googling, uh, you know, what's the plan for Social Security or what's the plan for health or what's the plan for... Uh, you know, Iran, they're, they're Googling much more superficial things, uh, you know, or, or, or these crazy conspiracy stories. They're always obsessed with that. So I think that is a little bit of a darker uh, take on it. I hope that politicians don't use that to just stop talking about policy. Uh, but I think, you know, it is unfortunate that we do learn that and, and we'll have to see uh, the best way to deal with that. Uh, I mean, in many ways, I don't think, I wasn't suggesting that they would, they would dumbing down, it was just that it was interesting that there was greater engagement with the subject when there was a big activity around it, like pulling out of the Paris Accord. Um, it's interesting, I mean, this is a brave new world of how we look at data, and, and you know, we've, we've seen that there's a sort of obsole obsolescing series of data gathering methods like focus groups and surveys and polling, and, and increasingly, you know, putting your money against the polls might reap you, um, a, you know, a win in the same way as putting your money with the polls in the betting shop. Not that I ever do that. Um, but, you know, if polls are no longer predicting election results and actually the sophistication of the kinds of tools that you're talking about and how we use these kinds of data is far more predictive, what will it take to change our system towards the use of these methods? You know, because we're, we're still seeing the same polling organisations still dominating the headlines ahead of you know, election results that they fail to predict. Yeah, I think uh, I'm obviously very positive about the power of these new data sources and not a huge fan of surveys. Uh, I, I wrote a whole book on the topic, but I think it's going to take a little longer to know how to use this data to predict uh, political events. Uh, it, it's, the polls have had many, many years to kind of refine their models, and they haven't had a great run of success recently, but they haven't been totally off. I mean, they're, they're three or four points off on on, on Brexit, and I think a couple points off on Trump. Uh, that kind of happens in, 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 in the world. I don't think we're at the point now where we can use Google searches and predict within two points where an election's going to go. Will we be in the future with using all this data on the internet when we have a whole bunch of elections and figure out what works, what doesn't work, uh, this is predictive, this isn't predictive, this used to be predictive, it's no longer predictive, we can wait it because these people are over-included and these people aren't included. I think we, we will get there, but it may take a few more years. Yes. 
No. Um, so, as well as the po political angle of this, um, which is, is fascinating, we could, um, we could stick on that, but there are, as you, as you shared with us, some, some pretty intimate and personal things that you've uncovered. I mean, I would say that there are huge numbers of this personal, intimate stuff in the book. <laughs> um, in fact, you wanted... We should conduct a straw poll of the RSA audience, actually. You had said you wanted an alternative title to your book, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass you now and make you no, ask no, the audience. A, uh, I, I'm used to it at this point, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, so I talk about how people make weird Google searches where you're like, why are they making those Google searches? So one of the most, uh, uh, so the most common body part that men ask questions about is, if you could guess, their penis, uh, not surprisingly, uh, maybe, but uh, more than any other body part by far, uh, like more than lungs, heart, liver, nose, ear, throat combined, I think. But one of their top questions about their penis is how big is my penis? Which, like, that's not the way to find out, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> So it's such an absurd search made with some frequency that I wanted to call my book How Big Is My Penis? What, what Google searches reveal about human nature. My publishers, like, uh, they, they, people will be embarrassed to buy that book and, like, hold it around and stuff. Exactly. So. It's, it's, the, it's the reading it on the tube. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> the moment that people... Well, I, I don't know. It could spark conversation. It could. It could. Well, I think it would spark conversation. Yeah. That's, um, you know, we're, we're changing the world here. I think it's fabulous. Um, but let's talk a little bit about this, you know, the confessional booth that is, that is Google and this digital truth serum. Um, because I think there is something there about how you get some quite deep societal stuff out of the closet and into societal discourse. And, um, you know, I mean, there's some of those things which seem like anomalies of, about, you know, preferences of different people Googling porn in different countries. But actually, you know, there are other things um, around, you know, concerns that people have about, you know, will I regret having a family? You know, will I regret... Um, is it normal? There was a, there's a big piece in your book that's sort of the preface of is it normal to? Which actually would be quite an interesting public debate, really, to have something where we actually think about is it normal to? So we can normalise some, or not, <laughs> some behaviours that, that at the moment sit in the Google closet. So I guess I've, I'm interested in your thoughts about how might we move on big conversations. You talked a lot about racism there. How might we use this in public debate? What, what could this be as a stimulus tool for public debate? Yeah, I think it's right. I think a lot of people probably feel alone in their insecurities because they're not usually talked about. So I think if you say, you know, like everyone's, in, you know, a lot of people are insecure about their bodies. One of them that I talk about... Uh, is I think we usually think of women as being, the, the, the conventional wisdom tends to be women are more concerned about their appearance and men kind of just don't, don't care as much. Uh, but if you look around the web, uh, uh, visits to weight loss or cosmetic surgery, uh, they're, about, they're almost as popular among men as they are among women, uh, and men don't usually talk about that. And then about 20% of searches for how-to and breasts are for men wanting to get rid of uh, man breasts, I guess. <laughs> Uh, which is kind of, you know, I mean, it does show, I think a lot of men probably think that they're really unique and weird in having that insecurity. And I think what, it, what this data shows is, uh, no, there are, uh, there are lots of people with that. And I think uh, people can be comforted in knowing, uh, in knowing that uh, they're not alone in their insecurities and anxieties. But it is normal to have man boobs. Basically, uh, and, to, and to worry about both to, to have them, them and to worry about there them. There you go. That, there you go. Public debate of the future. Um, it's. I mean, I guess this then thinks about it in the in its use and as a big data's use as a social science um, method. Um, in your book, you have some word clouds, which kind of do some. They do some segmentation of age and gender. Um, the interesting, the age one says that it's, what is it, drink, work, pray. And when you're young, when you're under 22, you just drink. And then when you're um, between 22 and 30, you just work. And then 30 to the rest of your whole life, which was quite a big data set, um, you pray. <laughs> um, and I, it's quite an interesting sort of segmentation to see what are people looking for in different times of their life. But I was more interested um, in how we start thinking about, you know, some of the gender differences that came out. Um, and I don't know if you remember that, that moment in the film Trainspotting where they're in the, in the club and come down and ask the boys, what are you talking about? And they say, football. And the girls, what are you talking about? And they say, shopping. Your, your word cloud says that. 
for the female and male, which I was a bit kind of mortified by. This is gender stereotypes writ large. Um, but then when we talked earlier, you kind of said, no, there's a lot more nuance to it there. So what can we learn about, you know, let's say gender from the, from the data that you've looked at? Yeah, so the word clouds are uh, based on Facebook posts. And this is not my research. Some professors uh, at Penn analyzed a whole bunch of people's, hundreds of thousands of people's Facebook posts men and women, and then young, younger people, middle-aged people, older people, and said what words are most disproportionately used uh, by, by different groups. And you're right, I think women, uh, some of them were uh, shopping and my hair, and men, it was football and Xbox and, and, and other things that are, they're kind of stereotypical uh, gender differences, uh, ba you know, based on the things they say on Facebook. And I definitely think, I'm not like totally politically correct that I don't think there, I think there are differences between the gender. Uh, genders, but I do think that pu publicly we probably exaggerate the differences between the genders. So I make a, a big thing in the book that there are different sources of data, some of which are more honest and some of which are less honest. So on Google, we tend to be very honest because we're by ourselves. Uh, we have an incentive to tell the truth. On Facebook, we tend not to be so honest because we're trying to show off to our friends. We're trying to say who we want them to think we are. And you can see that the Facebook data frequently doesn't match up with the real world data. People. Uh, are uh, claim that they're richer than they are, or more intellectual than they are, or happier than they are in all kinds of different ways. It doesn't really match up. Uh, so I think it, one of the things that's interesting is if you compare on Spotify data, uh, the, the music that men and women listen to, uh, the top kind of s songs that men listen to uh, and women listen to on Spotify when they're actually presumably usually by themselves listening to it, they're different, but they're not that different. <laughs> like Katy Perry in the time period I was looking for was like, number three for women and like number six for men or something like that. And you know, Jay-Z is a little more popular among men, but a little less popular than women. But then you see on Facebook, Katy Perry's much less popular among men because they don't want their friends to think that they're listening to Katy Perry, right? So like there's, there's, there's an interesting way in which whatever the original gender differences are in our private lives, they can get exaggerated in our public life. And we may learn that as we look at this data to say that uh, men and women are less different than, than sometimes we think, but just because they're trying to play into a norm to their friends, uh, they tend to uh, exaggerate their differences. That's very interesting. So I'm going to go to the audience. Um, we have some microphones in the back, so if you put your hands up if you have a question. So we'll start with the lady in the front, and then we'll go to this side here. This lady here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is it on? Yes, it's on. Um, I'm fascinated by your data, but can your Google data be skewed in that predictive text offers you a whole load of options when you start typing in? The question about women in India, or the question they're asking, if it pops up saying, my husband wants me to breastfeed him, wouldn't you click on it, for God's sake? <laughs> I mean, that's just too tempting. So. Isn't there a real risk that, that that is very, and also screwed because I'm an older person, isn't it also screwed by, skewed by older people not being so represented on the internet? Good questions. I think they, yeah, those are good questions. I think uh, there, there definitely, there definitely is a skew. That, that's kind of where I say, like, I'm not ready to say we can predict elections yet, because like we have to figure out how can we wait this, you know, surveys would be horrible if you didn't wait them at all, because many people, uh, there are huge differences in response rates among different demographics, but we know, okay, weight them so that these people count a little bit more. And we're not doing that with Google data yet. And I think we'll learn how to do that and they will get, get better uh, as we do that in the future. And then, you know, as, uh, you know, more and more people use the internet, the, the number of people who don't use the internet gets smaller and smaller uh, every year. That'll become uh, less of an issue. I think the autocomplete stuff is definitely, uh, I think it definitely does bias the data. You want to be really careful going from Google data to exact numbers. Like I can't tell you from how many people search, um, my husband wants me to breastfeed him, how many people in India have this, right? I can just say it seems to be pretty common in India and way more common than, than anywhere else uh, without at least at this point knowing how to translate that to exact number of people. I think with the autocomplete, you can't really get something out of nowhere in autocomplete because it has to get to first place initially, right? So it may be that if something's already first place, it gets maybe a little bit higher than it otherwise would have been relative to something that was lower down. But it's got to somehow get to that list uh, the first time. And it shouldn't lead to huge regional differences as well, uh, because, uh, because uh, the, the, uh, the auto, like within a country, because the autocompletes tend to have, be similar uh, everywhere. So I think it's definitely a, a way to consider kind of 
find, finding by finding, because this methodology is so new, like all these questions are really important when you see, see a particular finding. To say, okay, well, would that, could that possibly mean that this doesn't mean what I think it means? Like, okay, well, if that, that might mean that, uh, you know, not as many people have this desire, but clearly a lot more people have this desire in this country than anywhere else. So you have to be, so you have to kind of make sure to calibrate your, your answers to go with the, the results. Like with the racism in the United States, I don't think there's any reason. Actually, that, the particular word, the N-word, isn't included in autocomplete. So actually, on some of the racier stuff, it's a bias against them because they tend not to be included in autocomplete. But, uh, but, but like each, each one, you kind of have to say, okay, is, is, is auto, could autocomplete be explained that? Could some uh, demographic thing be explained that? And I think the ones I, I include in my book, I, I hope, uh, don't follow those criticism, but definitely uh, I get a lot of emails <laughs> arguing them, so, and that's good. Um, and I, I hope as we continue, uh, we'll kind of debate these through. There was another so gentleman there. Hi. Um, if I could play, if, call you the optimist here. You give the example with the two Obama speeches where Obama had given the speech and he had to sell this huge spike in kind of hate-related uh, searches on Google. And then you, you gave the optimistic, oh, we learned that in the second speech this became far more, it calmed the storm, so to speak. But if I can play the pessimist, you've also, the converse of that is true, is that a group of people have learned how to stoke the mob, how to stoke the fires, because you've given them that information. So my question for you is, is very simple. Do you think there should be some sort of regulation over access to these data trends? Because you're actually empowering people that could benefit from stoking the fires. You know, not softball questions from uh, yeah. London. <laughs> You're at the RSA. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, I tend to think that there are more good people than bad people, and that uh, well, I, nobody's called me an optimist before. I think, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I think, I, I mean, it's kind of any powerful tool. It's kind of, that's like kind of the technology. Anything that's powerful has. Potential for good and potential for bad, just about universally, right? So drones have potential for good and potential for bad, and more powerful computers have potential for good and potential for bad. And uh, I, yeah, you know, like yeah, knowing this much about people, if you've followed the Cambridge Analytica story, uh, where they're using, they they claim, I think their claims are exaggerated, and they didn't have as much much success from from what I gather in the in the British elections as they did in the United States elections. But uh, there, there's they they claim that they're kind of using psychographic modeling to uh, kind of control people's minds and push them towards a right wing, a more right wing agenda. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm skeptical of that, but I, 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 just the particular people I don't think are really doing it. But I do, I do think big data is very powerful and probably more powerful than people even realize. Uh, so to the extent that, uh, you know, yeah, the, the, can, it, can it be used in bad ways? Definitely. Uh, and I think uh, not even just like people want to inflame a mob, but businesses. I think that's, it's a real danger. The regulators have no idea what's going on. Like the laws we have are not meant for this age of big data. So you, uh, one of the things I talk about in the book as well is how uh, there are all kinds of correlations with, your, with who you are. And some of them are just kind of random. So if you like curly fries on Facebook, it's been shown that's a sign you have higher IQ. Okay, why? Like nobody knows. but. People who like curly fries are not identical to people who don't like curly fries. And for whatever reason, they tend to have higher IQ. And if you're a business, you don't necessarily need to know the reason for this. You would just, if you want to get higher IQ people, it wouldn't be wise to feed them curly fries because that would mix up causation versus correlation. But it could be wise to advertise to people who like curly fries or to hire people who like curly fries. And I think the environment we're used to and the ethical and legal framework we have is for businesses and governments to know five or six things about you. They, they, we know, okay, they know your education, they know your GPA, they know your race, they know your maybe, you know, housing situation. And this is what they're allowed to use and this is what they're not allowed to use. But now we have a situation where they know millions of things about you. They know the words you use and the likes you have on social media and um, things you've done on computers and previous jobs maybe. And machine learning and AI is just going to put this all in the model and just say, OK, and punish people without them realizing it and reward people without them realizing it. So I, 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 I do not think we should underestimate the ethical challenges here. 
you know, this book is kind of more exciting. Like from, from a social scientist, you're just like, oh, wow, this is so amazing. Uh, but yeah, I t t t there are definitely big ethical issues uh, that people have to work on and that we as a society have to work on. We had a speaker here earlier this year who, who said effectively you are democratizing marketing tools and putting nuclear grade tools into the hands of absolutely everybody. So how do we think about that ethically and, and through regulation and keep up with that at that pace? So it's a very live debate, I think, in that way. But keep the optimism up. I like it. I'm going to see if there's anyone over here, lady over here, and then I'll come back to you over there. Thank you. I'm interested in how you access the Google data, whether you pay for it, and uh, who else can access it? Uh, so basically everybody in this room can access it. Uh, it's Google Trends, which is an underutilized tool. Uh, it's not all Google Trends. I also use this thing called Google AdWords. Uh, it's a little technical. I talk about a little in my book and my, on my website, uh, kind of the ways to use it. I've been using it for a while. It's a little confusing when you first see it. Uh, I have a paper where I discuss kind of how to make sense of the data, or at least my best, uh, my best attempts to make sense of the data. But it is public, which I think is important. And that's another big advance on research. If this data really is public and th stays public, uh, that could be a dramatic approval improvement versus the current research, which is kind of tends to be locked away uh, by researchers. So I think you know, if we have a science where people can say, this is what I found, and they say, no, 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 you didn't consider that, then it goes away, uh, like science can move quicker and more publicly uh, to kind of find, find the truth. I guess the, the conditions there are that with Google, it's anonymized and public. Um, with social media, it's privately owned by, um, you know, you have a privacy agreement with Facebook or others, and they own you, so they can then sell that data on in terms of what your preferences are as an individual. So there are different kinds of data sets which you can look at with the varying degrees of, of public access. Yeah, and I think it's another kind of another ethical issue is we've traditionally, the best data has been in, the government has by collecting it. So the best data on the world, uh, besides surveys, you know, surveys, but like the data on, uh, you know, some health outcomes or the data on census, uh, the government has gone through a lot of effort to get that data. And then uh, there's a policy, there are policies in place that this is what they do with the data. Maybe researchers can access it under these conditions or can't access on these conditions. But generally, uh, the goals of a government uh, ideally would be to uh, protect everyone's privacy while furthering research as much as possible. And now we're entering a situation where I think unambiguously the co companies have the best data now, Google and Facebook, I, particularly Google, but, but uh, they have the best data now. And, and they're you know, their incentive technically is to maximize profits, uh, not necessarily to advance research. So I think they've been a very uh, good company and a very forthcoming. And I think it's great that they do make this uh, data available. Uh, I, and I hope that that continues and, and goes even further, uh, because I do think there's a lot we can learn about a society from this data. There was another question over here. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, firstly, fascinating. I really enjoyed it. Um, secondly, for the record and for your data set, five inches flaccid, eight inches erect. Uh, thirdly, um, oh, that's an estimate. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, yeah, so I'm, it's really, from, it's from, really... Did you get that from asking Google? Or yeah, no, I, I, I asked Google <laughs> about that. Um, thirdly, um, I'm, I'm, it's a really nerdy, uh, nerdy, dull question, but... Um, um, and it kind of came up in this conversation earlier, but also in the Guardian article over the weekend. Um, I, I can't understand how you identify gender or indeed any demographics from Google searches, uh, just from my, I'm assuming just from my IP address. Uh, sorry, and uh, fourthly, so I have a, sorry, first two weren't questions. So that's the first question was about um, identifying demographics, gender and demographics from IP, uh, from, from Google searches. And the last one was, I understand, um, I realize, you know, c completely the polls have been discredited over the last two, three years. Um, and I can see your argument about Google searching being a much more credible source. But how do you think it ranks against bookies odds? Okay. Good question. So uh, with the gender, so Google Trends does not tell you the gender of a user. Uh, Google does have an estimate of your gender. If you look up, you can see, and it's usually pretty accurate. For a couple of people, it's off. It's based on your internet behavior. And they give that data to other companies as well. So I also analyze Pornhub data in my book. 
And that data includes all gender because that's from Google Analytics, which is an estimate. So if you go to sites like Men's Health or something or Women's Health or various things you do on the internet, they'll say, OK, you're probably a man or you're probably a woman or you're probably this age. But you definitely don't know, you definitely don't know, don't know for sure. On the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Uh, I think with The Guardian, some of the things I was talking about with gender were things like uh, sexual stuff where it searches for like my penis, where I made an estimate that someone who includes that is a man. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, but you, you don't know for sure uh, the, the gender of a, of a user. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's, so that's a combination of Pornhub data and the Google Trends data, and then Google AdWords, which I also talk about. That's from visits to a website, and that they do break down the gender. So Google AdWords, that uses the Google Analytics and says people who went to gay pornography sites, what percent of them are men and what percent of them are, are women. So, uh, yeah, so, so, so there are ways for the actual searches, uh, you don't know for sure particular search, but website visits or a particular company, uh, you can have the more uh, gendered breakdown of, 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 of searches. And what, what was the other question? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I think what, what would happen is if the Google search data got better than polls, it would be incorporated in the bookies. And they, you know, so you wouldn't be able to beat them. They kind of figure it out first, uh, but the, the the odds would change a little bit based on this this indicator. So, uh, yeah. We'll never get fully ahead of the bookies, I'd say. Um, I think that's interesting, actually, that response because it, it, you said earlier that you know rather when in our conversation we had before you came on was rather than simplify things down to kind of broad categorizations, big data makes things more complicated or adds a lot more nuance. So when you were describing there how you come to some conclusions, that's about mixing different methods, different uh, data sets, and actually, so it's not we're not it isn't the case that everyone is a data scientist at this stage. You know, maybe these things are available, but there is still a lot of um, more complicated and complex thinking. You know, I, I'm, I'm interested in what does, this, what does this do to sort of drive a conversation about diversity as well? Because there's so much comes out of this data. Yeah, so I think, so Google search data is like messy data, right? So it's not like, so survey data is very neat data. It's structured, you have boxes. OK, like, are you male, female, male? Are you, how old are you? How, you know, you have your 10 questions. What are your interests? Are you interested in this? Yes, no. And Google search data is much messier. You know, some people make more Google searches. Uh, some people make fewer. Uh, so, some some uh, people make ser searches at different times and different ways. And I think, uh, you know, that, that, I think most people think that's a disadvantage in data because it's kind of harder to make sense of. But I think to to some way, I'm not totally sure I, I can exp I, I, this is right, but I feel like to some way it's an advantage because like humans are messy. So I think in some sense we've been boxing people in with some of these very structured data sources and needlessly simplifying things. Or si like when, the more data we learn, uh, the more we find that people are very, very different in different times. They have multiple selves. Sometimes they're this way, sometimes they're that way. Uh, and I think uh, it will complicate like in, make, it, make it much more richer and in many ways more complicated uh, view of people. Mm, that, that can only be a good thing. Um, any more questions from the room? We have one at the end here. Uh, thank you. Very fascinating talk. Um, I have two questions, both loaded. Okay. Um, <clears throat> firstly, why should I trust the data from Google? And secondly, are we in danger of seeing the world purely through Google's eyes, according to Google? Philosophical questions you get here. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason, I think Google employs a lot of uh, data, so it's a, it's a company by data scientists and employs a lot of data scientists. And I think they'd, uh, they're, they'd uh, maybe uh, throw a fit if the data wasn't, if they, if they were giving data to scientists that was in Google's interest and not in scientists' interest. That would be maybe one check on, on, the, on Google giving data that was uh, unreliable. You could also have legal checks 
eventually, right? So, so companies have to report financial information. You can say, well, why do you trust that financial information? Well, there's auditing and laws around uh, reporting. So you could have the same, if, if, if th that did become a concern, uh, you could uh, eventually uh, have some sort of laws. So, uh, what? That does not exist. You know, I'm not sure exactly what the incentives you know, of Google would be to present this data differently uh, than otherwise. But uh, you know, da down the road, maybe there would have to be laws if, if we found out that uh, there were incentives for companies to give false data. Well, this, this takes us back to the conversation of, of having a conversation about ethics and regulation and incentives in a very live and public forum to which you have added to this evening. Um, so if I, I, I think we have any other questions from the audience, one in the front here, and then one in the back, and then we'll take it. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of talk in the last few years about uh, how we measure how happy we are. We tend to do that with surveys at the moment where people say how happy they are, which has got flaws <laughs> that you know, people even doing the surveys know about. Can you add anything to this from what you've been able to do? Uh, I think definitely, I think, uh, so I've looked mostly at the mental health angle of it. So people who search depression or search for anxiety or panic attacks, uh, that, that's a little different because it's kind of an extreme negative. It's not like very happy or just okay. Uh, that might be a little bit tougher. Uh, you know, that, that maybe people don't Google a search. Uh, Google search when they're, ha when they're happy, the, a different when they're okay or whether they're doing great. Uh, but I think definitely mental health is an area where we can learn a lot and are learning a lot. And I've already done uh, a lot of research uh, on, on this topic. So one of them, uh, maybe you'll be unhappy to learn this in, in Britain, is just the, ex the extent to which climate seems to play a role in depression. Like, would you kind of, <laughs> you kind of would have guessed, but it's just like, like in the data, it's very, very clear in winter months. Like, I think I, I estimate, and other people have written similar stuff analyzing the same data, that it's like 40% uh, fewer depression searches in a warm climate like Hawaii. Uh, I, I'd name one in Britain, but I don't think there is. Is there a warm climate in Britain? Yeah, Cornwall, maybe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Com compared to Chicago, which like 40%, 40 I think like antidepressants, the best reading is about 20% reduction. So that's like a massive effect on mental health. Uh, and after, I, I also mentioned in the book that after I uh, published this finding, I moved from California to New York. Uh, <laughs> so like it's kind of sometimes easier to find what you should do than actually do it uh, as a data scientist. But uh, I definitely think, uh, you know, I, I, one of the things I am, I've, I wrote, write in the book a lot about anxiety, but I'm trying to really uh, research it more because like, like you can measure now with Google searches. It, I, I didn't talk too much, but you can see the minute by minute searches people make. And not surprisingly, when do people make panic searches for panic attacks most? Like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., they're waking up in a cold sweat. And probably most people uh, searching panic attack at 2 a.m. Are, are having a panic attack. But you can actually say now, like on every, any given Tuesday, to a, a pretty strong degree, how many people in London are having panic attacks? How many people in Boston are having panic attacks? How many people in New York City are having panic attacks? How many people in Paris are having panic attacks? And you can say, okay, well, what happened during the day? Is it just random that some people always have panic attacks? Or is there something during the day? Or is there something two days earlier and it comes later? Like, the, the degree to which this is, I'm trying to, like, just capture the degree to which I think this changes. Like, it, it's, that's, like, really rich data set to turn something seemingly as chaotic as panic attacks into a real science uh, and, and, and eventually re hopefully reduce them because they cause a lot of pain to people. But Fascinating. So we had last question in the back there. Um, have you got a microphone? Good, we're on. Uh, c great talk, thank you. A couple of quick things. One, um, I saw in the paper the other day that Google's going to stop trawling Gmail for targeting ads. So as part of the question, where does Google get its data from for the searches or for its data sets beyond search? And I suppose the second question is, um, what does Google use its data for beyond targeting AdWords? Everything you've described is about companies and scientists and academics using it, but I just wonder how an organization like Google or Alphabet uses the data as well. Uh, yeah, so, so one thing, this is a, pu a public story. I, th I, think, I, I think I read that Sergey Brin at some point had told Eric Schmidt, the, C the CEO of Google, that we should just turn ourselves into a hedge fund. 
And then Eric Schmidt's like, that's the dumbest idea ever. That is so illegal, you have no idea. So I don't think they're using it. I'm pretty sure they're not using it for, 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 those, for those purposes. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think mostly, so I think uh, to target advertising and then to target, there's always some debate about, I think they, to trying to make search, you can try to make search better based on what you know a person about a person, right? So if I've searched for phones a lot recently, uh, then if I search for Apple, I'm more likely to be looking for a phone than a fruit. Whereas if I've been searching for like recipes uh, and then I search for Apple, maybe I'm more likely to use a fruit. I don't know if they use that, but I think I've read articles about trying to do things like that or, or taking, in someone's, taking into account things you know about them to make the search uh, better. Uh, is something that they've been talking about doing. I don't know to what extent they do that. Well, I think we've learned huge insights into the potential of this kind of data and our analytics and, um, and where it might go and the ethics and regulation and incentives we need to think about um, as we progress into this brave new world. But thank you for your um, wide-ranging talk there that took us through. I mean, there was probably too much filthy talk in this room for my liking, but... Um, <laughs> But it, it was an all good debate, and so I've really enjoyed that, and I think that our audience has too. Um, copies of Seth's book, I believe, are in the, in the foyer, and I'm sure he'd be happy to sign copies for you. But um, before you rush out and do that, please join me in thanking Seth with a big round of applause. <laughs>